welcome to Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Ben Max, Executive Editor of Gotham Gazette. Today I'll be talking with New York City's new public advocate, Jamani Williams. Recently a Brooklyn City Council member elected to the citywide position of public advocate in the February 26th special election. The public advocate is one of just three elected citywide positions and meant to be a check on the mayor, the city council, and all of government that is supposed to serve New Yorkers. The public advocate is first in line to the mayor if the city's chief executive is unable to serve his or her full term. The public advocate has the power to introduce legislation to the city council but cannot vote on bills. It is a watchdog for city government and investigates New Yorkers' complaints about agencies, programs, and services, and meant to be a tireless voice for all New Yorkers. The public advocate's office comes with a lot of responsibility, but a relatively limited budget at about $3.6 million this year. The February special election for the position occurred after Letitia James was elected attorney general. There was a lot of competition. At one point, almost 30 candidates were running for public advocate, and 17 names wound up on the ballot. But on election day, our guest today, Jamani Williams, won by a considerable margin with 33% of the vote. While campaigning, Public Advocate Williams promised to transform the office and the city. So let's get an idea today of how he plans to start that work and where he wants to take New York. Public Advocate Jamani Williams, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How's it feel? Uh, well, this is a, the first interview, do, interview I've done since it was official, so I'm still getting used to it. Yeah. So uh, part of your campaign in 2018 for lieutenant governor was about sort of turning that position into being public advocate. And when you ran for public advocate, um, you sort of talked about how that was a very natural segue. Is it kind of a relief that you aren't the lieutenant governor and now you get to be a citywide elected official? I mean, is this sort of a... A, a dream come true in a way that that having to deal with the whole state wouldn't have been. I am. Um, I try to make sure I'm ready for whatever position I'm running for. So I was very excited to run for lieutenant governor, and I was excited for the prospect of turning that into all, that office into something I still believe the state actually needs. Uh, and then this opportunity came along, and so I'm excited about this as well. Uh, so I wouldn't know. I, I wouldn't say it's yeah. either or, but I'm excited about what we can do with this office now, building upon what what people previously have done. So let's let's zoom way out here. Your vision for New York City. What is, you know, the mayor ran on ending the tale of two cities, then he's ran for re-election on turning it into the fairest big city in the, in the country. What's a Jamani Williams sort of vision for New York? What what is that? You know, look I think like? in 2013 when I endorsed uh, the mayor, he was kind of going to be kind of the blue wave before the blue wave came, right? But, um, and it's been disappointing because we haven't seen that for many years. And it seems that maybe he's coming back to us now uh, in, in, in certain ways, perhaps because he has some other ambitions. Uh, but I, what I found in, in this administration in particular, and others generally speaking, they have a tendency to do things to people. And I want to see a government that's doing things with people. And I'm hoping the public advocate office can kind of fill that gap and where there's a space where communities can really have a, a space to have a conversation about what's happening in their communities. Because a lot of times, if those conversations occur, uh, I don't know that it's uh, something that people will say, if there's something that's happening they don't want, they'll say, oh, all of a sudden, oh, we want it. But the conversation makes it go a little easier. It's like sometimes sweetening the medicine mm -hmm. to go down. It just mm -hmm. makes it a little easier. And I think people are missing that. Say a little bit more about that. What is what is more? So, so your vision for New York City is more of a community-led uh, vision that that communities have more input into decisions that government is making. What does that look like? What what are some? Examples? I think it has to be right. And so, when you when you're talking about things like Rikers, when you're talking about rezonings, when you're talking about homeless shelters, it's clear there's going to be difficulty in all of these conversations. But it's that much harder. Well, we're not having a conversation with folks and saying, this is why we have to do it. Where is a space that you think is better? Let's talk about the issues and not just dismiss your concerns. And when we do that, I think we'll have a better, uh, we'll have a better process of putting things forward. When you think about policing, uh, even people like George Kellen, whose name uh, is scorned in um, police reform, because uh, he, you know, he talked about his broken windows and zero tolerance, but even he, when you speak to him, his plan was to make sure that communities speak with police to tell them what they want policed. 
that conversation doesn't happen. And I think if you have those type of conversations, you see a much different byproduct than what we see now. And so would we expect a public advocate, Williams, to be personally going around the city to a lot of community meetings and helping to navigate negotiations with the city administration? Or what does it look like in terms of the way you approach that, that role? I think yes and. Uh, the first thing we did, because we're still in the process of transitioning, but the first thing we did was make sure that yeah, we had- I'm getting you on your first day and I need you to, yeah. need, need you to have all the uh, answers. We've had all the problems yeah. solved already, done, yeah. <laughs> I can go home. Um, but we, we're still in transition. We have to do in a few weeks what most folks do in several months, mm -hmm. um, but we, we're ready for the task. And uh, the chair is Ify Ike, who is actually herself running for public advocate. We're very excited. Uh, senior advisors Mark Green and L.J. Williams will be expanding that out uh, in a few days. And we're going to staff up. But we made sure right now we have enough people to handle the individual complaints that are coming in on a regular basis. So that's one part. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, I plan to go around the city pretty often. Um, and we very much plan to implement the concept that we discussed, which is having uh, deputy public advocates or a, a person like that in every single borough. Because I think about it in the organizing mentality to make sure we have an up and down stream of communication, information coming from the community so when something happens, uh, there can be a response and we can have a community response. We did want to try to make sure that we had uh, offices in different communities as well, so we're trying to move forward with that. Of course, there is no agency that ever says they have enough funding to do mm -hmm. all of those things, so we plan to engage the council and the mayor to see if we can get some additional funding for the office as well. As I said, in the open budget's about $3.6 million for the current fiscal year, but it is budget negotiation time. Uh, we did an article about the office's budget, and, and the mayor's office said, well, we're already proposing another increase to $3.8 million. Do you have a number that you want to see the, the We don't budget? have a number yet. Uh -huh. um, we're still going through the process of figuring out what positions were available, why they're there. We did say that we were going to restructure the office, not because uh, it was necessarily bad in a way, but the ideas we're bringing in terms of community organizing model uh, with the deputy public advocates is a different uh, conceptualization. So we're going through that now. But as well as we want to have conversations with the mayor about uh, COPIC, which uh, hasn't been funded in quite some time. And we want to make sure that we get some funding there uh, to really- This is a public information commission. Yes, absolutely. Almost no one knows about, but, but it has a very important role in, it does. Ter yeah, in terms it does. of getting public information out to New Yorkers and publicizing meetings and, and all sorts of data. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. And unfortunately, it has been zeroed out by the administration for quite some time. We think it's a very powerful vehicle. Uh, right here uh, in Manhattan, Councilman Ben Kalos has been uh, championing this as well. And we think that needs some funding so people can understand what's going on in our government. When you talk about 58 uh, with policing as well, uh, this might be a way to get around some of the issues that we've seen there. Interesting. So is there any room for maybe partnering with the borough presidents or something like that? If you're going to have a deputy in each borough, you know, I know you want to maybe keep uh, rent costs down, right? You don't want to have to have an office in every borough. Maybe you do. I don't know. Is there is that something you're thinking about who to partner with or how to how to set some of that up? We definitely want to um, talk about in-kind services as much as possible. We want to make sure we're using the people's money as efficiently as possible. We did originally want to try to get offices where we saw the highest number of CCRB complaints. Because right. generally, if you see that, that's just because they're trying to address a bunch of, the police are sent to address a, prompt, a bunch of problems that they probably don't have the tools to address. And that can often lead to over-policing and then lead to those complaints. So that might be a good area to concentrate on to see what issues are going on. Uh, so to the extent that we can do that, we want to, but we are mindful of funding. And to the extent that people are offering in-kind services, we definitely want to look at it. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but already uh, there was a borough president that offered that, and there was, okay. I was very thankful for that. And on the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board that takes complaints about police misconduct and, and investigates them, um, is there anything you want to see on the CCRB beefed up, changed? Uh, you know, there's a Charter Revision Commission happening now, as you well know. Um, which could Im could impact the public advocate's office certainly, um, but but there's some things being debated about the role of the CCRB. Any any changes you want? There? I mean, of course, they, they should have subpoena power. They should have the ability to go after uh, some of these cases uh, independent, uh, without the without the commissioner being able to come in and say we're completely ignoring what you're doing. Right, and so that's one of the problems. There is no place that this type of investigation can go where the commissioner doesn't have the final say over everything. And that's a problem. And we have to identify where that space is. And I think the CCRB is a great place. And you want subpoena power as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. So in the, in, the, in the 
public advocates office, I think the two things that are pressing is one, subpoena power, and one, an independent budget. And so right now, it's based on whatever is put in the budget by the mayor and the governor. If you're the watchdog over, I'm sorry, the mayor and the council. If you're a watchdog over the mayor and the council, uh, they may get a little mad at you sometimes, and that may reflect itself in the budget. I We've don't seen think that, that in the should past. be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, not, not recently. The mayor was, was pretty good with, with Tish James, the public advocate, about, about increasing the budget, but we've seen that in the past. Yeah, with, I think um, Bloomberg. when uh, uh, you know, Betsy Giuliani. came in, yeah, mm -hmm. from, from uh, I think Mark Green, it was cut, and then it was cut even further uh, when Betsy came in. That shouldn't be the case, and I think most New Yorkers understand that, even though they are uh, very wary about money being spent. I think they understand that a watchdog should have an independent budget to do the job that the people elected them to do. If you have subpoena power, what are you looking into? I mean, what are you demanding? You know, what kind of um, documents do you foresee looking at? Or are you, you know, is it is it just that you're coming in with sort of an issue mindset, or you're trying to really figure out how decisions are being made? You know, what are the things that a subpoena power would allow you to investigate? Well, right now, one of the jobs that I really want to explore is that of the charter cop that was given to the public advocate. Basically, the public advocate is supposed to ensure that agencies are doing their charter mandated duties on behalf of the city. And in that regard, cities actually, the agencies have to actually respond to the public advocate by charter. Sometimes they don't. And then what happens then? I think if you give explicit subpoena power, power it just empowers the public advocate to do the job that they're supposed to do. Again, when it comes to disciplining of NYPD, how that happens, when it happens. Uh, we're thankful they have a new system now that we're getting some more information, mm -hmm. but we can always use more because we haven't, the, the, the areas where, we've seen improvement in policing, the areas where we haven't is transparency and accountability, and we can use some more there. Uh, when it comes to the DOE, uh, there's a lot of questions about uh, where certain monies are being spent, um, where certain uh, uh, independent lines are put in the budget and what's happening with that. And so there's information that we want to get from the DOE on counselors, why there are not as many counselors in the schools, uh, issues like that. Uh, ACS, we get a lot of complaints of mothers losing their children for things of poverty, not a lot because of neglect. We hear that a lot from black and Latino mothers. I'd like to get some information about that. So there are different agencies where people are complaining, but we're not getting the information we need here. I think the public advocate has a large role here. Even if you boost up your budget, your staff, you go out into the boroughs, there's going to be so many things coming at you, right? There's going to be complaints, there's going to be local officials, citizens, whoever, sending things to your representatives, sending things to your office, and then there's your focus issues, which you just already are passionate about. Do you have any sense of how you're going to make those decisions, what investigations to take on, um, you know, what, folk, what reports to issue, you know, those types of things. You're going to have to make a lot of tough choices in terms of issues to prioritize. So I think this is a, a question that every elected official has to face. They've, they've come in on issues they care about, and then they have to listen to constituent complaints, and then things just arise. And so we're coming in still with the, the bullets that we spoke about uh, of housing being Yeah, I was key. just going to get to somebody, so uh, let's, let's do it. Housing is critically important, uh, whether it's NYCHA or the rent regulation that's coming up in June. Uh, we're probably going to travel the city really quickly to try to empower folks uh, to make sure Albany hears about the strengthening that's needed, uh, people who are losing their homes to foreclosure, generally speaking, and through city programs. Uh, and of course, NYCHA. Uh, we're trying to set up a meeting right now with Lynn Patton uh, to see if we can get some money uh, behind some of the other things that occurred, including having She's a local management. federal uh, yes. representative yes. for HUD. For HUD. Uh, and you, you've had some, some tense exchanges with her on social media. She was staying at some of the NYCHA complexes, yes. and I think you sort of called it a photo op. Well, you I want think to see money. It's a photo op unless something happens after. Like, everybody knows how bad it is. I can't say it's bad to go spend time there because you do bring cram uh, cameras and you do bring resources, which is important. But um, after that, where is the money that's coming behind? And she raises a good point. Money behind bad management is terrible. Mm -hmm. But that can't be the excuse. We all agree we have to fix the management. I think they are getting better because uh, hopefully we've stopped seeing lies about uh, what's happening with lead and management. That was a huge problem. That is the mayor's problem. Um, and then we've seen divestment from the federal government and, and from the state. Uh, and the city has to pony up as well. So uh, I don't want to hear any excuses. I just want to see the action around mm -hmm. it. <clears throat> I mean, it's um, not that different than civil disobedience, right? You're trying to, you know, you, you've talked about, you know, putting your body on the line mm -hmm. is a phrase you used in the campaign and getting arrested for certain mm -hmm. causes, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. Um, but uh, 
it's you know what she was doing was sort of bringing attention to oh, an yeah. issue, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that, and, and but you have to fine. get results. After. You got to see. You uh -huh. got to see the results. Uh -huh. after. Particularly someone who's so connected to uh, the current president, uh, who just recently made some slashes and cuts to it. That doesn't. That doesn't really bode well. Um, and, you know, and uh, issues. And she sort of dismissed the president's budget outline as we know that's not really going to happen. <laughs> I, it's easy to say if you don't live in Nigeria, mm -hmm. I guess. Right. And so we've seen these cuts before. My hope is that she's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we have a right to be afraid. Um, the head of HUD has said before that poverty is a choice. And so we've seen these type of draconian cuts before. We expect them again. Hopefully that won't happen. You know, um, as you mentioned, the issues of transparency and accountability, uh, which we want to see from Amazon uh, to the police department. Um, issues of criminal justice that I've wor always worked on. Uh, and we have an issue that uh, is now coming more to the forefront around specialized high schools. Yes. Uh, which is an issue that I think is very germane uh, to the times. Something I've been speaking about uh, since I got into the council as well, but it seems to be coming to a head. And that's some place that I want the public advocate uh, to have a real space to help push a conversation. So what's that conversation? What, where do you want that to head? The admissions to the eight specialized high schools in the city, um, the city controls the admissions to five of the schools, uh, could basically do something pretty quickly about that system, although the three sort of quote unquote big ones, um, it doesn't, that's state law. But where do you want to see that, that head? So I graduated from Brooklyn Tech, so I come with a, a unique uh, kind of uh, point of view. Uh, what the mayor put forth, I don't support and will never support un un unless we change it. I always say I, I would not have gotten to Brooklyn Tech if they had used any other criteria. Attendance, uh, grades, I just wouldn't have gotten in. Mm -hmm. Most of the folks that I knew were the same way. I had a friend who actually was about to get left back in the eighth grade, <laughs> took the test and got in, and that's how come he wasn't left back. He's now a very successful attorney. We have to ask questions, why in the, eighth, in the 80s and the 90s, there was a huge population of Caribbean and, and blacks in Brooklyn Tech. It's completely dwindled. And in Stuyvesant, I mean, uh, I mean had, yeah. There, no, were, there, were, there were hundreds yes, in yes, Stuyvesant. Absolutely. Yeah, Stuyvesant. Yeah. It was yeah. bad back then. Uh, now right. it's abysmal. Right. right. And so what's happening? Why is that trending? It can't be just a test. Mm -hmm. But I would agree that maybe you don't just have one thing that shows how you have access to that point. Mm -hmm. That was what worked for me. So I'm open to a discussion about maybe you open up some of those seats to people who can show multiple criteria to show that they can do uh, perform as, uh, as well uh, in those same schools. But you don't have to take away my access point to do that. And you shouldn't do it in a way that is pitting communities against each other. That's interesting. I don't know if I've heard anybody say, take a certain percentage that still do the test and then take a, a certain percentage of seats and it's multiple criteria. Why not? Why not? Let's discuss Interesting. It. Yeah. Uh, Tom Allen had an editorial in Daily News today. Maybe we need to open up some other schools. I was just going to ask you about um, that. Mm -hmm. In uh, different areas that we need to see more uh, people come out of. I'm open to that as well. Um, the feeder schools that were going to places like Tech, school I went to, Philip Scott, uh, half of the school now, uh, Bloomberg made it into a charter school, and it took away the gifted and talented programs. Those were feeder schools into those schools. And so we shouldn't think about a soundbite way to, to address this. The fact of the matter is DOE as a system it's failing. And we're focusing on the eight schools, but we're not looking at other places. And lastly, I think it's critically important to understand that my understanding is that the top tier multiple criteria schools right now in the system are not that much more diverse. And so but the schools that currently use a, a variety of metrics yes. for admissions are not necessarily much better. They're, they're somewhat better, but Perhaps, in terms and, of diversity. And, and so, but in a, and, and even particularly around uh, black males in particular, they aren't. And so, you know, don't present this plan like this is a, uh, the thing that's going to cure everything and pit communities. Against, why would you pit the Asian community against the black and Latino community? That was very unsavory and an irresponsible way of doing it. A lot more we could go there, but let's, let's go back to a couple other issues. So housing, uh, housing has been probably your number one issue. You mentioned a couple things coming up. Um, aside, aside from advocating in Albany for changes to the rent regulations, which is obviously a massive issue coming up. Uh, after the budget at the state level, what are some things in the city that you're pushing for? You've got a couple bills that you have said you will continue to, to advocate for. Um, what are your top priorities? Well, on, we on have one I was speaking to, uh, Chairman of Housing Building, just recently about third party transfer um, to look at the, the more term that we put forth. Um, the last wave already happened, but we want to get ahead of it before the next wave. This is where people actually lost their homes to foreclosure. Uh, it lost their homes to programs uh, based on foreclosure 
that the city did, and they made mistakes. And of mm -hmm. course, most of those families that mistakes were made were, were black families, uh, and that's a problem. Um, there was a string of issues in Brooklyn. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a big one. I want to reopen uh, mandatory inclusionary housing. Uh, I think we have to take another look at that. Uh, for you want a moratorium on neighborhood rezoning? For the most part, I, I think there's some some spot areas where we may have to do it because it, it actually helps the situation right now. But for the most part, we should have a moratorium on neighborhood rezonings until we re look, until we look at the current MIH program mm -hmm. because it is a it is a failure. And most people look at this, understand that that zoning proposal that we put forth was a failure. We are now, thankfully, adding things to it, but it's not mandatory because they're not in the zoning law. Uh, and I also the other would, things. The right, other right. things. So how do you know? I'm not. I, I'm not sure. I've seen that sure. most people recognize that. But let's just take that aside. How do you know it's a failure? How do you know? You know, these rezonings are going through of neighborhoods or of or of individual plots that if developers want more land, you know, more height, more density, they have to build a certain percentage of units. You don't think it's enough. Um, you don't think the level of affordability is, is low enough for, for folks who really need affordable homes. Um, but how do you know it's a failure? Doesn't the city need more housing? Yes, well, we need more certain types of housing. And so uh, we have more homeless now, this now than before this uh, proposal went through. Um, people are more rent burdened now than they were. If you look at, and some of the numbers are changing, so I'm happy they're adjusting the, the housing plan, but if you look at the amount of housing that's being built, it doesn't match where the problems are. So if we're building more housing in the income bands where they're not rent burdened in the same way, that is not addressing the problem. We cannot get out of the housing problem if we're not building housing for the people who need it the most. And so most of these rezonings are building more market rate housing than anything else. How is that, how is that helpful? And you know, I always say I want to see an income mix because let's say 165% AMI, maybe 120,000, 30,000 uh, for a family of four. I actually believe those folks need assistance. If you're a firefighter and a police officer, you need help in this city. And that's astonishing. But if you need help, well, that, that's yeah, that's the mayor's <laughs> argument for having a more balanced plan. Awesome. Okay. But if they need help, where's the people at thirty and forty percent AMI mm -hmm. making thirty thousand, making forty thousand, and we're making the least amount of uh, assistance for them? That can't happen anymore. And the problem with this rezoning is it allows options that don't go in that lower income band, and that's an atrocity. All right. So you want to reopen that? We got about five more minutes. And I also so. think we need to have a racial impact study okay. before any of these neighborhood rezonings go on. So reopening those numbers, is there appetite for that? You would need a groundswell in the city council. Mm -hmm. Do you have that? I'm going to try. Okay. Uh, well, I've spoken to uh, council members who believe that it is a problem. Uh, whether the political appetite is going to be there mm -hmm. uh, is something else. Uh, you know, I spoke to the mayor preliminary about it, and I plan to speak to the speaker about it. But my guess is originally there will, uh, there will initially be uh, some resistance, but if we can get a push, uh, I don't see why not, because this is a number one issue, and I, I'm, hopefully I can make this into a mayoral issue, make sure that all the candidates are discussing what we need to do about MIH, the racial impact study, and the moratorium until we fix the problem. So you're saying make that into a, a issue for the 2021 mayoral race. So Absolutely. since you went there, Still not running for mayor in 2021? Absolutely not. Okay. So who, who do you have one of the likely candidates that you are closest to that you think is should be the sort of front runner right now? I do not. Uh, okay. This is the first interview I've done since officially being public advocate. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to fix, uh, <laughs> fix the stuff in, in our office to make sure we can present uh, the best office for the people of the city of New York, and that's what I'm focused on. And I really hopefully sincere that the mayor gets to... Uh, get to the rest of his term. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, right, so you don't have to get thrust in there. So back on housing for a second. You mentioned 2021, so I jumped there. But um, homelessness, mm -hmm. what, it, what are you coming into the public advocacy's office? Obviously, if there are changes to the housing plan to create more homelessness, uh, more housing for lower income folks, that might be people coming out of shelter, right? Because there are a lot of working people who are in shelter. We know that. Um, is there anything else to fight homelessness, especially families, kids in shelters, that you, you want to do? The answer to most homelessness is housing, period. And so my hope is that we'll no longer have two commissioners, one for housing, one for homelessness, two deputy mayors, one for housing, one for homelessness, two plans, one for housing, one for homelessness. It's one plan. 
at the same time, we do have to look at the types of homelessness that's occurring. Because homelessness, some homelessness, uh, most folks think of the people in the street. Uh, they're not the mass majority of folks. The vast majority of folks, including city workers, which is a shameful, that are in these shelters who are working poor and cannot find in, uh, a, 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 a suitable a unit for their income. But there are then people who are uh, in shelters and homeless because of domestic violence issues. There are some who are there for substance abuse. They need additional services besides finding a safe shelter. And then there are the ones where people normally see uh, in the street who uh, a portion of them uh, have some mental health issues and supportive housing is also additionally needed. And so we usually tend to blump them together, but we got to figure out who we're speaking of and provide the services that are needed. But f it is safe to say for the vast majority of folks, housing is the issue that's needed. And so we need uh, some additional subsidies. And we have to make sure if we're building housing, we're building it for the people who need it the most. Okay. Uh, last couple questions, a final minute here. Um, do you have a sense yet of how you're going to measure success? How, how will you, as public advocate, know if you're doing a good job? Do you have certain metrics planned? Is there a way you get a sense of those things um, from past experience? Do you know yet? It's a good question. Um, the, I had There was something I, I used to use or I tried to implement called results-based accountability. It's a pretty long process. But we're, gonna, we're thinking about revisiting that again. Uh, but generally speaking, I think government needs to be working. So if all of us are successful, people generally feel better about government, um, and they can find a safe place to live. Uh, we think about public safety in a different way, not just policing, but also having access to safe housing, having access to health care, having access uh, to quality education. There's no one person responsible for that. We all have to work together to make sure that that's working. And so uh, you know, my, by myself, I can't do it, but my hope is at the end of the day, people will believe that this office did the very best they could have to make decisions based on not what was politically best for me, but what was politically best for the people of the city of New York and help mush, uh, push these conversations forward. Final question. Um, you made a lot of waves with your uh, victory night speech, uh, nice write up in the, in the New Yorker about it as a, as a breakthrough. Um, do you see? Um, what you said about, you know, you, you talked directly to, to black men, um, you talked about being in therapy. Uh, do you see it as having been sort of a breakthrough moment? And where do you hope that that, that conversation goes next? I had, I had initially think of it as a breakthrough, to, to be honest. When I saw some of those words, I was like, I, I didn't think about it in those contexts. I assume people had done things like this before. And so it was um, humbling to see those words. But I did know it wasn't talked about very often in the communities I came from. And I, I did want to address that. And I hope that conversation continues. I've been so honored by the just the stories that have come back for me, and not just from black young people, and, and not just from men, uh, but from women. And, in different communities all the way saying, if you just replace this word, it's me. If you just replace it, this adjective, it's me. And, and the people who are saying they are now more comfortable talking about their therapy because of what I did. And people talking about conversations they had in classrooms. You know, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, powerful, that's yeah. amazing. We'll leave it there. Public advocate Jamani Williams, thank you thank very you. much. And thank you for watching Represent NYC here on MNN. I'm Ben Max from Gotham Gazette. Goodbye.